Hello creepy friends and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today we'll be doing my June reading wrap up and the mid-year book freakout tag. So get your favorite drink and get cozy. Hi everybody, I hope you've all been doing well. In the video you'll be watching me finishing up my June reading journal spreads. In the voiceover, you'll be hearing my short book reviews for the three books I read in June, and since it's the middle of the year now, I'll also be doing the mid-year book freakout tag. That's a kind of book survey that's been going around for a couple of years on YouTube, and in it I'll be talking about my best and worst books up to the midpoint of the year, some surprises and disappointments, and more. As always, links to all the books and everything else that I mention, as well as all the materials that I'm using, will be in the description box. My voiceover reviews will have no spoilers. However, when you get to the point in the video where you can see me writing the reviews in my journal, if you don't want any spoilers, don't read what I'm writing there. And one more thing before we get started. Apologies for the state of my hands in this video. I got a little bit scratched up, but I'm totally fine. Alright, let's get started. Dance 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 by Haruki Murakami Read this if you're looking for a story of a man searching for a woman who has mysteriously disappeared. A strange hotel that has places that both exist and don't exist. The uncanny. People who are not what they seem. And some returning characters from Murakami's other books. This is one of Murakami's earlier novels, and it's the fourth book in the Rat series. To be honest, all of these books in the Rat series are kind of blending together for me. This is the last one, and in it, the unnamed main character returns to the Dolphin Hotel in Hokkaido, where he previously spent time with a woman named Kiki. He's looking for her, as she has mysteriously gone missing, and when he arrives at the Dolphin, he finds that it has been completely rebuilt into a modern and beautiful hotel, but that it has retained the name. He starts a relationship with one of the front desk clerks, and they begin to find that there are places in the hotel that are not quite in the same world as ours. The main character also befriends a famous actor, who was one of the last people to see Kiki before she disappeared. As he spends more time with this seemingly caring man, he starts to learn about his dark past. As usual in Murakami novels, the characters are not completely distinct, you don't get a deep feel for their motivations, but the dialogue is interesting and well written and the main character's sense of restlessness comes through. You can tell you are reading Murakami. One usually reads Murakami for the vibes, at least in my experience. I'm looking for that very bizarre and unsettling feeling that, is some that something is not quite right. This seems to be prevalent in Murakami's later work. While this novel does have a touch of magical realism and some discomforting imagery, it's not as strange as his newer writing. I'm reading all of Murakami's books in roughly publication order, but I think if you only want his hits, you can probably skip this one. When We Were Orphans by Kazuo Ishiguro Read this if you're looking for historical fiction set in the 1920s and 1930s in London and Shanghai. A look at the colonialism in China at the time and the opium trade, an unreliable narrator, a gorgeous and lyrical writing style, and a mystery about what happened to the main character's parents and whether they are still alive. Kazo Ishiguro is one of my favorite authors, but this was my first time reading When We Were Orphans. Every one of Ishiguro's books are gorgeously written and have beautiful characterization and dramatic and beautiful prose. Ishiguro can really evoke emotion from the reader. That being said, I would probably place this lower down on a ranking of Ishiguro's books. Our narrator, Christopher Banks, is English but spent his young childhood in the early 1900s in Shanghai, playing with his neighbor, a Japanese boy named Akira. Christopher's father is somehow involved in some shady business involving opium, and both his parents go missing when he is 10 years old. The adult Christopher has become a detective and has been obsessed with the idea of finding his parents, believing that they have been kidnapped and are still alive. When he returns to a war-torn Shanghai to look for them, he starts to uncover the unsettling truths of his childhood. 
Ishiguro is considered one of the masters of the unreliable narrator. In this book, you do get more and more information about what really happened as the book goes on, but it doesn't seem that Christopher is purposely hiding the information from the reader. I found the story to be sad, but I wasn't as attached to these characters as I have been in some of Ishiguro's other novels, like Clara and the Sun and Never Let Me Go. Overall, it's delectable prose, but the story is less engaging, but still worth a read if you enjoy Ishiguro or other works of sweeping and emotional historical fiction. Pizza Girl by Jean Kyung Frazier Read this if you're looking for literary fiction about a young pregnant woman who is slowly unraveling, a main character struggling with alcoholism and unresolved grief, a study of obsession and how we sometimes use it to avoid our troubles, interesting and well-written characters, and a dramatic ending. This debut novel follows an 18-year-old pregnant Korean-American woman who has graduated high school and doesn't really know what to do with herself. She gets a job as a pizza delivery person and lives with her mother and boyfriend. One day, the pizza shop receives a phone call from a woman pleading with our main character to help her. It seems that the woman's son will only eat if he can have a pickle and pepperoni pizza with the pickles baked on. Our main character's interest is piqued and she brings the order to the house, meeting the middle-aged Jenny Hauser. Thus begins an obsession with the main character becoming more and more disturbed with her obsession taking over her life, eventually going to unhealthy and scary lengths to try to be closer to Jenny. This short read hooked me at the beginning with its approachable and easy to read prose. I enjoyed the characters and they felt like real people and the main character's feelings of despair, obsession and desperation were easily felt when reading. I think she could fall into the category of an unlikable female main character, but I felt empathy and sadness for her as well. This book was a great debut, and I'm excited to see what Frazier writes in the future. There are a lot of difficult themes around addiction, depression, pregnancy, and obsession, so look more into the content warnings before picking it up. But if you enjoy literary fiction about unhinged women, this is a good one. Now let's start in on the mid-year book freakout tag. The first question is, what's the best book that you've read so far in 2024? My favorite book so far is Untold Night and Day by Bay Swa. This is a surreal, short novel written by one of Korea's most famous authors. The main character is wandering around during a day and a night in Seoul during a heat wave. The surreal writing really makes you feel like you're in some kind of fever dream or suffering from heat stroke with its disorienting and cyclical writing style. What's the best sequel you've read so far in 2024? I really loved A Desolation Called Peace, which is the sequel to A Memory Called Empire. This is a sci-fi duology by Arkady Martin. This duology has political intrigue, an assassination, and first contact with an alien race. These are really fun and approachable sci-fi books. A new release that you haven't read but want to. I'm really looking forward to reading Private Rights by Julia Armfield. I read Our Wives Under the Sea last year, and I really enjoyed the ethereal and creepy feeling that it gave. This book follows three sisters and is a retelling of Shakespeare's King Lear. According to the summary on Goodreads, it is a haunting novel of three sisters navigating queer love and faith at the end of the world. Most anticipated release for the second half of 2024. I'm really looking forward to Absolution by Jeff Vandermeer. This is the fourth book in the Southern Reach series, which previously was only a trilogy. So this is a little bit of a surprise for all the fans. I've talked about the Southern Reach series at length on my channel because it's one of my favorite series of all time. It's trippy sci-fi horror, so if you want to know more about it, check out the links in the description box. Biggest Disappointment For me, the biggest disappointment this year so far is Dahlgren by Samuel R. Delaney. This is supposedly a masterpiece of sci-fi and was written in the 60s. However, I didn't really get the point of it 
and I didn't really enjoy it that much while I was reading it. I was really expecting it to be something amazing, since it's been hyped up to be such a masterpiece, but it just didn't work for me. Adding to the disappointment is the length of this novel, so I spent about a month and a half or two months reading it, and ended up not liking it in the end. Biggest surprise. My biggest surprise was The Adventures of Amina al-Sarafi. This isn't a book that I would normally gravitate to, as I'm not usually one who reads a lot of adventure stories or pirate stories, but this book is very, very exciting and very, very delightful. The action will keep you on the edge of your seat, and the characters are funny and endearing. Additionally, there's all kinds of representation in this book, including transgender, and there's even a sea monster. Favorite new author. I've already mentioned one of my favorite new authors because she wrote my favorite book this year so far, that's Bei Sua. But I'm also mentioning Monica Kim, who wrote The Eyes Are the Best Part. This is Kim's debut novel, and it just came out in the past month. It's a gory horror book that looks at racism and misogyny, and some terrible men get their comeuppance in the end. I'm excited to see what Kim writes in the future. A book that made you sad. For me, I think the saddest book that I've read so far is Razorblade Tears. This story is about two fathers who have to grapple with the murder of their sons, who were gay and married to each other and had a small child. During their life, their fathers did not accept them for who they were, and now, faced with regret and pain, the fathers are out looking for who killed their sons. This is a wonderfully told tale of friendship, redemption, and loss. A book that made you happy. While The Change by Kirsten Miller does deal with some heavy topics, I had a lot of fun reading it. It follows a trio of women who, as they enter perimenopause, start developing special powers. And then they use these powers to get revenge on some men who have been doing some terrible things to young women. It was a cathartic read that had a lot of humor in it, and it was a lot of fun. Favorite book to movie adaptation you saw this year? This is definitely Dune Part 2 for me. I read the book about two years ago, and I really loved it, and I think these movies are gorgeous and really well done. And if you have the opportunity to watch Dune Parts 1 and 2 in 3D, definitely check it out. Favorite review you've written this year? I don't know if my review for Ein Hallow is the best review that I've ever written, but it's my favorite because it's the first time I ever reviewed an ARC or an advanced reader copy. I was really proud of this one because I spent a lot of time on it, and it was my first review on NetGalley. This is a gothic and atmospheric horror novel set in Scotland that's retelling one of history's most famous horror stories. Most beautiful book you've bought so far this year. This was really hard for me to decide. I've bought a lot of beautiful books so far. But I think I have to return back to the Southern Reach series, Annihilation, Acceptance, Authority, and Absolution by Jeff Vandermeer. I just love these psychedelic looking covers. And the first three books are being re-released as a 10th anniversary edition. And Absolution, as I mentioned before, is coming out this year, in October. I am obsessed with these covers, with art by Pablo Del Can. What books do you need to read by the end of the year? Unfortunately, my NetGalley ARC percentage is not doing so great this year. So I have several arcs left that I still need to get through, including Mystery Lights by Lena Valencia, The Deading by Nicholas Bellardes, 100 Shadows by Huang Jungyun, and Supplication by Noor Abi Nahul. And right now, I'm currently in the middle of reading Barrier Gaze by Chuck Tingle and American Rapture by CJ Leed. Thank you so much for joining me. This was a lot of fun. I've never done a tag before on YouTube. I can't believe that 2024 is already halfway over. I've had such a good time making content for the last six months, and I hope I can continue in the future. Thank you so much for your support. I wouldn't be able to do it without you.
If you've been enjoying my videos, please help me with the algorithm and like and subscribe. And also, leave me a comment letting me know which book has been the biggest surprise for you this year. Please join me next week, I'll have one of my most exciting videos of the year, a mid-year flip through of my entire reading journal. So you'll be able to see everything that I've done and updated so far this year. And the following two weeks after that, I will have my August setup for my reading journal and my August setup for my bullet journal. I hope you'll join me for those. For longer book reviews, join me on my website, bibliocreep.com. And for more book review and journaling content, also join me on my social media channels. My handle is always at biblio underscore creep. Wherever you are in the world, have a great July. Please remember to take care of yourself, drink your water, take some time to do something that you enjoy, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!